Hello and welcome to the Space News Commercial Space Transformers series, where we aim to give you a behind the scenes look at the people and companies driving the space industry's commercial transformation. I'm Jason Rainbow, Senior Staff Writer at Space News, and today I'll be talking to Adel Al Saleh, CEO of SES, which operates satellites in geostationary and medium Earth orbit and provides broadband and video services. SES is in the middle of buying rival satellite operator Intelsat in a transaction worth more than $3 billion, which is just one of the many consolidation deals we're seeing in the industry as Starlink shakes up the state of play. And Adele brings an interesting perspective after coming from outside the space industry to take the helm of SES in February. Before that, he led German telco Deutsche Telekom's IT services subsidiary. Adele, I'm very excited to have you here. Thank you very much for clearing some time to talk with me. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Jason. How are you doing? We were talking yeah, about Paris. You're saying you haven't recovered yet. Yes, uh, so. No, no, I don't think I ever will. Um, it's just ongoing. But um, here we are. But, the, you know, what matters now is we have some time together to talk about, well, not just Paris, but um, next year and, and, uh, and beyond. So, the, uh, the commercial space industry is experiencing, I'm sure you've seen a surge in new entrants and innovations. Uh, how is a legacy satellite operator like SES working with smaller startups and other companies to remain at the forefront of this evolution? I assume you are. Yeah, look, Jason, the, the level of investments coming in, especially for startups, is quite staggering, right? So in 2023, I think there was a study that said about 17.9 or 18 billion worth of capital deployed around the startups of community. That just tells you the level of investments coming into the industry. And, you know, they all bring very interesting aspects to a very established market of developing products and, and, and developing solutions. So in order to be competitive and in order to ensure that we are, you know, the forefront of some of these inventions and new ideas, we have to work with these startups. Mm -hmm. And the question becomes, well, how do you filter through it, right? How do you prioritize it? Who do you work with? And that is a process we're going through as a company right now at SCS uh, to, to really to, to hone in better, right? To, to make it even more targeted. Because it's very easy to get distracted and meet with hundreds of companies who are super creative, very interesting, but focus on specific areas where we think those those companies can take us to the next level. And that's what we're doing. Glad to hear it. So we're, we're with the rise of satellite con uh, constellations, particularly in LEO, how does SES see its role evolving in the geo MEO markets and what competitive advantages do you bring to, to those areas? So Jason, we are, as you know, we've been talking about this now, even be before I joined SES, we are a true believer in multi-orbit. Um, <clears throat> We don't believe that a single orbit from a single provider is the answer to all. Um, not because this single provider can give you different you know, options, but it's just limited in terms of what the market may need, the resilience that we need to have, and you know, innovation and kind of creativity and options that you need as companies. So we believe in multi-orbit. Obviously, we are very focused on the MEO, and the geo. And from a geo perspective, we have a very nice, you know, um, fleet. It continues to be important to us. As we look forward to the Intelsat um, merger with us, we see that we will need to be very selective in which geo satellites will be replacing in the future. So in order to differentiate ourselves, we will be focusing on the geo areas that still have a lot of value for the specific applications that the customers see still very much value the geo capability. Of course, in the meantime, in parallel, we are building out our MEO network, right? And, and Jason, I'm very conscious of using the word network, right? Because what we're trying to do is not just think about a constellation to a constellation, like we did in the past with O3B Classic and then Empower. We're thinking about what kind of network do we need to have in MEO to truly be able to be competitive in the marketplace and give people many different options to deploy across different applications. So you'll see us very much driving more and more investments into the MEO network, if you will, over a period of many years. Um, and I won't tell you about the numbers yet, but you will see us very aggressively scaling that network over the, the next few years. And of course, Leo, 
remains important as a additional capability that we would use when we need it. Uh, we're not thinking of getting into Leo business. We think that space is quite crowded right now. There are a lot of investments, a lot of big players that are putting money into it. So the best strategy for us is to partner with these folks when we need them to complement our network in order to deliver the solution to the client and maybe invest in a few very specific specialized area of leo so we could be launching leo satellites in the future but they are to do very specific things like quantum key distribution or a very unique thing in terms of uh, surveillance or things like that that the government may need right in order to be able to uh, deliver some of their solutions. So that's our strategy. That's our differentiation. And lastly, Jason, just to tell you is at the end, we are a true believer that what will make a difference to the client is our ability to deliver a solution, a solution that fits their needs rather than talk to them about, well, we got Mio and somebody else got Leo and we got Geo. We're going to do the best that we can from the three orbits to deliver a solution to our client. Right. And so where is multi-orbit, this multi-orbit network, uh, particularly important? Because it's it's interesting to see some big contract wins Starlink has been having with airlines for Leo-only broadband services, despite multi-orbit antennas being now pretty much pretty much ready to go. Uh, I'm not look, I wouldn't say that the multi-orbit antennas are 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 ready to go. They're getting there, right? They're, they're getting into the market. Volumes are not scaled there yet, not only multi-orbit, but also we need multi-band uh, antennas as well, right? So that's something that you will see coming into the market over the next two years, right? And they will start scaling. Um, and there will be instances where the customers decide to go single source. Um, and you are giving a few examples. I am a true believer that over time, the customers are going to need multiple options. And I believe in airlines, that the ones you mentioned, as the Airbus and, and Boeing begin to start integrating these solutions at the manufacturing site, rather than doing a retrofit later, they will be installing antennas that are multi-orbit and multi-band multi to give their customers different options. Mm -hmm. And I believe mm -hmm. as the customers experience with a single solution or a single option, they will decide whether or not that solution is good enough over a period of time. I'll give you a practical example, right? Today, in Cruise, where we are an important player, but so is Starlink, by the way, an important player in Cruise, we share the loads of our customers between SES and Starlink. We both coexist on majority of the cruise ships, right? Majority of the cruise ships have both. And our cruise business continues to grow. Starlink's whose business continues to grow. The demand for capacity from that particular customer continues to expand because of the services that they're offering their end user and customer. And one of us just individually um, cannot deliver everything that the cruise needs, nor do the cruise ships want to be reliant on one of us exclusively, if you will, for the entire service for their clients. So I'm truly believer that multi-options, multi-orbits, multi multi-bands are going to, is, is the way of the future for our clients. Hmm, I see. So Leo Broadband is the new kid on the block, but it still has a bit of a head start um, over multi-orbit antennas and, and bands, but that will catch up soon enough. And then you see it expanding uh, in a few years from now? Yeah, over the net, look, it, it is expanding in certain markets already. Government is a good example, right? where government is using all orbits. Cruise is another very good example. And Aero is beginning to get there, right, as the antennas are going to get ready. Energy is already there, so telcos are there. So, you know, it's, it's actually already there in the marketplace, but some of them are, are a little bit ahead of the others. Got it. Thank you. Okay. And then what about the, the balance then between government clients and commercial customers? How do you see that evolving and... and um... What new commercial opportunities are you most excited about? Um, so, Jason, both are really important to us, right? I think for satellite industry in general, the governments continue to be an anchor industry, right? Because geopolitical dynamics around the world, um, the fact that the whole defense and deterrence 
um, is moving into space, right? It, it's always been there in terms of surveillance, in terms of communication. More and more applications are going up in space for governments, not just military, but also with digital inclusion. And that will continue, right? So being there with the right technology, with the right services um, is really critical and with the right qualifications, right? Because you do need to not only have the people, they've got to be secured, they've got to have the right tools, they've got to be cleared, all of that things that are going to be very important for, for government work in the future. But commercial clients, you know, they're also driving a different kind of innovation and a different kind of scaling, if you will, right? They are more willing to take, um, um, to, to embark on new things. They're willing to try new things. They're willing to be faster, if you will, with new technologies. Um, and we like that, right? So there's a lot of innovation involved in driving commercial customers adoption and then actually sharing that innovation across to the government sector as well. So we see it very, very, um, as, as both very important to us. And if you think about um, kind of the way we approach the market, right, and how the governments are beginning to think of it is the governments and led by the US, but also you can see the European Union and Japan and Australia are beginning to think in the same themes, UK, where they're saying, I want to leverage more of the commercial capability, right? Mm -hmm. So things that I never used to use before, I would like now to use them in order to complement my broader network, to give me more resilience, to give me more access, if you will. And with that, you actually need to do both. You need to do something very specific for the government and develop that business. But the commercial business that you're developing will also benefit the governments over time as they expand their architecture to include commercial capabilities. Hmm. Connectivity is obviously a, a, an important market for, for SCS. What role are you looking to play in advancing the adoption of 5G networks via satellite? And how do you see satellite technology integrating with terrestrial networks in the, in the coming years? Uh, Jason, that is, I think that's an area where we are behind, to be honest with you, as, as an industry, if you will. Mm -hmm. If you think about the ease of integrating a non-terrestrial and terrestrial networks, um, it doesn't exist yet, right? So we are moving very fast in SES and thinking about APIs and how do we expose these APIs to the terrestrial um, players. Uh, but it starts with standards, Jason, right? One thing that we are investing in quite a bit is making sure we get to the right standards to be able to reuse some of the technologies and easily connect the different networks in the future. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we are a contributor to TM Forum, right, which is a telco-driven forum that defines the architectures and defines how things should be um, connected and, 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 and architected. Um, we are, I, I believe so, I think we are one of the, if not the only satellite operator that has been um, um, qualified within TMF um, as a user or the first adopter of what's called ODA, Open Digital Architecture, right? Which is what we're deploying across our IT landscape within SES. But that also moving very, very quickly to other components like the core network and the ORANs and things like that. Uh, so MEF Forum is another, or MEF Forum is another forum that's defining how these open networks are interconnect. So we are a big player and a big contributor into these standards. And we will be adopting them already on the way into our networks and how we do business in order to be able to connect better to the terrestrial networks in the future. And our next generation of satellites, Jason, will have no question 5G core capabilities, both in the satellite, but also on the ground. Right. So that is coming as well. That's an investment decision we have already made as a company that in the future we need to have these cores in order to be able to connect to these terrestrial networks going forward. Are we talking about um, direct to device or direct to smartphone satellite services here or, or is that a little? Oh, uh, not necessarily. Right. This is about having ability to connect to 5G networks. Direct to devices, of course, part of that opportunity as well. Right. And we as a company are actively, you know, trying to decide 
what role should we be playing in that direct to device, right? You know, should we be joining a few companies in order to drive their initiatives or should we be, you know, going a different direction? That's something you will hear from us, Jason, I would say by end of the year and where we are going to be aligning our focus and uh, our investments going forward. Very cool. All right. All right. And then looking forward, maybe into next year, uh, what major technological or, or regulatory challenges do you foresee impacting the commercial space industry and how is SES preparing to address them as one of the you know biggest multi-orbit operators out there? Jason, our biggest, in my view, we've got a bunch of challenges, but a few few big challenges that I want to I want to share with you and, and your audience. So first of all, our innovation cycle, so think about as our product development cycles and our manufacturing cycles remain very, very long. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes it difficult, right, to get to market fast, to scale fast, and then create economies of scale, if you will, right? Because we, we, we tend to build things one off in the mm -hmm. industry. My colleagues in the industry may be upset with me, but look, it's something we can't afford anymore, right? So we need to find a way of how do we really live by the idea of agile development, iterative approach to launching our networks, et cetera. And, and I, like I said, we're gonna be doubling down on our MEO network build out, right? And, and we're not thinking of it, we're trying not to think of it the old way, which is what's the next constellation after Empower? And let's build X number of satellites for that constellation. We're thinking of it now as a continuous network. And therefore, we would like to get into a cadence process where we're gonna be launching X number of satellites every year. And every year we're going to be upgrading those satellite capabilities, but without alienating the installed base, mm -hmm. right? So keeping that installed base acts as a foundation that will scale with us going forward. So we're driving there, and you'll see us, you'll see us approaching it in a different way, right? You'll see us announce things and and start developing uh, these approaches going forward. So that's one area, a big challenge for the industry. Right? Because the demand is moving very fast. The customer needs are moving and evolving. So the days of you know taking five years from product inception to service, uh, I think are gone. Right? I mean, mm -hmm. if we don't change, we're just not going to be competitive, right? If you will going forward. When it comes to regulatory environment, that is also becoming really important, right? With with a congestion that's beginning to happen around the LEO orbit, um, we need to be now careful how do we govern both spectrums, orbits, you know, power, you know, there's been a big discussion, right, in, in, in the circle of satellites and in the last ITU forum, um, et cetera. So that's becoming more and more critical as more and more people go into space and, 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 and build constellations. Um, and I believe it, that whole regulatory environment needs to move faster, right? They needs to be more adaptable going forward um, to serve the needs of the NGSO satellite operators like ourselves and Starlink and Kuiper, but also not forgetting the legacy, if you will, uh, GSO satellites uh, uh, that are out there. I lost the last little bit you said um, about the NGSO satellites. So what I was saying is, you know, we've got to have the regulatory framework and environment that's moving faster and being more agile and right. you know, serving both NGSOs as well as GSO satellite operators, right, in, in, in the future. Great. Yeah, absolutely. And that, of course, won't just benefit SES, but the, uh, the entire industry um, moving forward. Adele, thank you so much for, for taking on all these questions from all over space. Really appreciate that. Um, very interesting and exciting times ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Good to see you. Good to see you.